to jump 1,000 cars. Sir, you have a 1,000 cars. I don't think I'd attempt to try this stunt. Or we, we, we owe this horsepower to Uncle Sam. Oh, Too many car. car. You know, roses would be... Uh... Like, I put my beer belly on it. Yeah. And you can't immediately tell somebody how many cars you have. You'll really give those uppity yuppies something to think about. Stay on the bar. Don't go yeah. off the bar with your Bronco. 1980 Volvo horns. What's right? Like, me, me. Yeah, I want a man's coolant. <laughs> And he's like, oh, I thought it'd be small. It's for a small car. And I'm like, yeah, but it's, it's still an automatic transmission. They're never going to be light. It's definitely going to have to crash. Starting off with Brad buying another car. That's the West. <laughs> Internet. You know, is this a Nigerian oil print? Uh, I also wish you drove a tan Camry. Anyways, anyway, that, that's har- a horrible, very horrible podcast content. A very a inside joke. They'd love to be driven hard. Welcome to Auto Off Topic. How are you, Brad? Good evening, Andrew. What's going on with you? Oh, just uh, making some podcasts with you. I mean, that's the obvious answer. Was there? It is the obvious less answer. Obvious answer. Uh, less obvious answer was I just did. Um, I just finished a a e, EAWRC rally with our for our esports team that's on our Discord. So excellent. And you finished dead last. No. Um, I'm really, the, it's run by another Discord called like Junior WRC. Um, so it's like people across the world are racing against our team. And I'm in the, uh, we're, we're running the 1600 cars from like the mid 2000s, that class. So, only three people have finished and I'm in second. So really, I don't know. I don't know. Not too bad. We'll see how far it erodes over a week because they, they're they open for a week. So, Oh, the road conditions change as time goes on? No, no. I mean, I meant my my positioning, how my positioning oh, will erode. No. Okay. Will erode over a week. Yeah. Because that would be cool if the thing eroded over each individual person's Well. Head. Time. Yes, because so there's two classes. Uh, I am the second tier, and there's a higher level. So the higher level technically gets on the road first. Quotation marks on the road first. So yes, our in the class that I race in, we have more road degradation because we are later on the road. Interesting. Yeah. Very realistic, I guess. The game is really, really good, and they just announced that they're doing some uh, DLCs for it. So, um, mechanics are really good. This is different than the rally game that I was playing before? It's the same people. So, EA Sports bought out Codemasters and the Dirt Rally games. And they just took a lot of those same people and had them make the EA WRC game. So like a lot of the vintage cars are the same, but this one has a Glant VR4 in it. And um, yeah, it plays, it plays really well. It plays really well on the wheel. Um, it's kind of crazy. Cause like I just did an hour straight, <laughs> like nine stages, or like 49 minutes. And boy, is... your arms tired. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that wheel's got a lot of torque, so. But, uh, no, it was super fun. Uh, and yeah, we'll see. There's like, there's like 50 people in there, but maybe 30 people run consistently every week. So we'll see where we, where I land up. I think I was, last week I was just outside the top 10. So. Well, I'll have to pick up this game once I have my setup put back together, which is planning on putting in the garage. Yeah, and I will probably do some own some odd off topic club rallies. Especially when, as winter when, comes. When, as winter comes, yeah. Because which right is exactly now exactly when I don't want them. Yeah. Because right now it's a pretty it's a pretty big time investment to spend an hour playing a rally and then if you have multiple ones. So Oh, for sure. 
but I think it's probably the reason I stopped playing before. But I need to figure out a better way to do it. We but, try to do like a little bit shorter rallies, older cars. So, but anyway, um, yeah, that's what I was doing before I popped on the podcast. Excellent. I I was uh, working, so I won't tell a story about it. Yeah, because the old time difference. Thanks to the time difference, yep. But um, I think, uh, I don't know, should we just get into, do you have a lot of project car updates or a lot on one car? I have a lot of project or car truck? update. Yes. You want to just get into that? Or I do mean, you want to talk well. NASCAR for us? It's, it's what the people want to hear. Uh, yeah, we'll talk NASCAR afterwards. Yeah. Because it was a good race this week. It was a it was an amazing race. Yeah. Um, super, super <laughs> entertaining, crazy drama as far as points and everything. Like, wild race. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I um, teased that I was buying something. So I bought something. Yeah. So, um, well, as you probably know, there was a time period when I bought too many cars. And that time period was any time in the past 25 years. But I realized that I was kind of at a, a limit of cars in my life. After I bought the Mercor, which would have been what, November of 22? Or 23? No, definitely 22. So it's almost 20, November 24. So that's two years. I have to double check now that it was November 22 or 21, because now I don't remember. Do you remember? I should remember. You shouldn't remember. It must have been 22. Anyway, when you got the argument. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was 22. Because you came out here after I had it. So, uh, yes, November of 22, I've confirmed. Yeah, at some point in 22, I drove it. Yeah. So, probably, you probably drove it 23. Um, Anyway. So, yeah, I bought it in 22. Now, I haven't bought a car since then. So, that's, what, almost two years? which is, for me, a long period of time. But I also said to myself that I would not be purchasing any more vehicles until I got rid of some vehicles because I was at like a full-on too many cars. I realized there's too many cars, too many projects, don't have time to get them all done. If I want to start getting things done, I need to start pairing things down. And cue all of our friends saying, we've been hearing this for years. So anyway, I did put one caveat in that rule that I will not buy another car unless it is a first gen two-door Montero, Dodge Raider, or four by four first gen or second gen Mighty Max. Now, I really didn't want a second gen. And... I wasn't really searching for a Mighty Max or a Raider Montero. But a friend of mine, when he heard my my rule and what I was looking for, uh, informed me, I think I might have said this before, but I'll tell it again from the get-go just because, that his father had one that I thought he bought brand new, but actually it was one year old when he bought it. So almost brand new. A first-gen Mighty Max 4x4. Now, I don't know if you've searched ever for one, Andrew, but they are not common. The two-wheel drive you can find pretty easily in a first gen, but I didn't want a two-wheel drive because if I was going to buy another vehicle, it was going to be so we could take it off-roading and go camping and exploring in the great state of Arizona. So... I didn't really, wasn't really digging, wasn't really ready, was going to wait till I moved some stuff. And then on top of him being like, I have one, <laughs> I started talking to him about it and it turned out that it was a five speed truck. It was an all original truck in straight, mostly straight, rust free state in uh, Northern 
Arizona, in the just north of Sholo, Arizona, which is not close. It's uh, about four hours each way, but that's okay because it's you know not going anywhere. I didn't need to rush out and get it that day. And this is probably initially like a year ago. Now, probably shame on me for not getting rid of anything in that year while I was trying to make this happen. But uh, the truck was at his father's house, which is the house he grew up at. And his father, at this point in time, only spends summertime up in Cholo, and he spends wintertime down in Gila Bend, which is down by Yuma, down like near Mexico. So it's three hours the other way from here. So it's like a seven-hour trip in between. So once he leaves the house in north of Sholo, he doesn't usually go back until the following spring. And his father wanted the truck out of there now, or seems like more his mother wanted the truck out of there now, because it's been sitting there for quite some time, which we'll get into next. So he sent me two or maybe three pictures of the truck, and... I was like cautiously optimistically excited because it was a four by four. It is complete and it was. So anyway, since there's a seven hour drive in between, um, he wanted to get it done and there was a break there. I apologize if this is, we had internet switch cut it out. up a little <laughs> bit story wise. Cause I'm trying to remember where I started from or where I ended. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, just explain why it is a weird predator. He said that. Um, anyway, so I asked him to find out what the thing cost and what his dad wanted for it. And his dad came back with the magic oh, price. Yeah. What's the magic price? So lo- long time listeners will know the magic price is $800. So uh, I have yet to have been screwed by an $800 car. <laughs> so you know what you're getting. You're not getting a perfect car. You know you're getting something that's going to require work. You understand that it's an $800 car. You don't go into it assuming that it's going to be a completely sorted, ready-to-go car and not cause you any problems, like some cars that cost significantly more than $800 and cause you problems. So I said, yeah, I'm in. Like, I'll take this truck. Uh, Going on two or maybe three kind of not great, not close-up pictures. And hoping for the best. Because again, it's in north of Sholo, which is four hours each way. So it's an eight hour round trip. And I've now committed to this thing that I've never actually seen. Not the first time. So it's fine. That part doesn't bother me. So big thanks again to Naomi's brother, Chad, because he has that Ram 2500 that I've used a few times now for rescuing my cars when broken or buying new cars. And he offered it up again. Maybe offered it up is the wrong word. He accepted my invitation to borrow his truck for myself again. And we rented a U-Haul trailer and decided to uh, set up up there this past weekend and pick up the truck. So, spoiler alert, I have a truck. Double spoiler alert, it's, uh, it's not bad. So speaking with my friend, Mike, whose dad owned the truck, he said, I know the front tires hold air. He said the rear tires are questionable. So bring either tires that wheels and tires that fit or give yourself some time to take the wheels off, bring them into town and get a couple of junk tires mounted. So I decided to figure out what the bolt pattern was and see if I could find a set of wheels and tires to use. And I could, thankfully. Uh, Jordan had that high ace van, I think I've talked about on this podcast before. And a Toyota high ace van has the same six lug bolt pattern as the Mighty Max, which is the same as the first gen Montero. It's the same as a GM from the 80s or 90s. It's that standard truck six bolt pattern. I think it's what? Six by yeah, uh, five and a quarter or something. Some it's probably five and a half American standard oh. or six by one, five and a half, five and a quarter. I don't remember. I forget already. But it's the standard bolt pattern they all have. So thankfully, he had a set of four wheels and tires, 
that he had taken off of that van and they would fit this truck. So I brought all four of them just in case. What I did not anticipate was, and I probably should have, that they use a tuner style lug nut so I could only really get them just slightly more than hand tight on the truck. So that was a sketchy problem, but that's okay. Once we get to this place, or almost to this place, my friend says, when you get there, we get to a certain street, he goes, call me. He goes, so I'll know when to go down and open the gate. Because like a big manual gate. I was like, okay. What he neglected to tell me, <laughs> which is funny, was that his father lives on a 40-acre compound that required three or four miles of dirt road travel, like class four dirt road travel to get to. Like if we'd gone in there in a two wheel drive vehicle towing a trailer, it might have been difficult to get in there. Yeah. It was it was not a simple process. It <laughs> sounds was, like getting the uh Cressida. It was almost exactly the same. Except way rougher of a road because not a city maintained road like the other one was. It's just private drives basically. So anyway, I get in there and it seems it's a very similar scene to picking up the Cressida. And finally get there and see the truck and I'm more excited now than I have been the whole trip, obviously. Put the wheels on and then his dad goes, all right, I want you to put your truck at the bottom of the hill. We're going to push this thing and I can get momentum down the hill and you can go right up on the trailer and I won't take any work at all. I was like, all right, well, this thing was sitting for a long time. He's like, yeah. Do the brakes work? Since when? He's like, uh, probably 2003, 2004. So I'm like, all right, so that's 20 years. Uh, does it have brakes? He goes, ah, I'm sure it does. He goes, even if it doesn't, the e-brake works. I know that. All right. So I get in the truck, and I pull the e-brake. It's connected to nothing. It doesn't do anything. I'm like, all right. Well, there's no e-brake, so hopefully the brakes work. So he pushed the truck out of the parking spot, and on flat land, it's got enough to stop it. All right, this is the first time this truck has moved in 20 years, and the brakes work. This is this is encouraging. So we roll it to the first little bit of hill and get some momentum. And I'm like, I yell at the window, like, hey, I'm going to jam on the brakes now, just to make sure. So I jam on the brakes, and the brakes worked. So I'm like, all right, well, I guess this is it. We're going to... Uh, we're going to go for it. I'm going to roll down this hill and hopefully I don't wear around Chad's truck. <laughs> go right off the end of the trailer. Also, this is the first time I've ever driven this vehicle. The windows haven't been cleaned in 20 years. I can't see anything. I'm trying to go down a hill and hit the exact ramps perfectly on a U-Haul trailer that are, you know, not that wide and make sure I don't go off to the side or miss the ramp or go too far. All right, here we go. So they just start pushing down the hill. I pick up some speed, I jam it up on the trailer, and uh, first try. <laughs> Nailed it right in place. Hit the brakes. The thing stopped. All was good. <laughs> so it could have been a disaster, but it wasn't. So we'll take it. So trucks in the trailer. It's all loaded up. All is well. Um, trail it at home pretty much incident free the only incident was i brought my jack with me which has a bad seal so i also brought hydraulic fluid with me and the plastic bottle of hydro hydraulic fluid when going through the mountains at elevation change exploded Ugh. and covered the bed of the truck and the i say mighty max but it's a ram 50 on the trailer with uh thankfully non-corrosive um, hydraulic fluid for a jack, like mineral oil, basically. So, other than that, it was it was uneventful, but it was it was a full day for sure. Uh, big thanks to Naomi for going with me and and putting up with this. But on top of it, my friend's dad, who I've never met before, super cool guy. So, lives on a like I said, like a forty acre like compound. Has lived there since 75. Has collected 
what I can only describe as a very Brad DeSantis collection of cars on his property. I can probably say with confidence, this is not the last car I'll be pulling out of that property. <laughs> um, a little background, he's lived there since 75. He built the house himself while him, his wife, and their firstborn lived in a bus on the property. The whole house is off-grid. Has been since the 70s. It's never been connected to the local electrical power. He's run solar panels since the 70s. And always just upgraded as time has gone along. He read a book in like 1973 about how to build an off-grid house. And was like, bet. I can do this. And he's been doing it for... 40 years, 50 years, excuse me. Um, super impressive place. He also builds ultralight airplanes and flies them. And the reason he has the two properties he has is because they're big enough that he built a runway so he can fly from one to the other. Okay. What an interesting guy. Yeah. Very interesting guy. Very interesting guy. Those two things um, sound like, like the, I mean, those were things that I feel like were very popular in the 70s. To build solar power and ultralights? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. But super interesting guy. And the whole property is littered with cool stuff. Some might look at it and say it's trash. Some might look at it and say it's great. But, I mean, there was like a 71 Ford F-150. That's pin straight and perfect. Sorry, but F-100, excuse me. Um, I know a lot of our podcasts listeners and friends are big fans of his of uh, Isuzu's. There was a four-door trooper, first-gen trooper on the property that's in impeccable shape, but it's got a cracked head, um, which I guess they all do. There's a 64 Rambler 400 station wagon, which is like a perfect north, you know, high desert patina on it, which I was like, I would like to buy that from you someday. Um, there are four Opal Mantas, two restorable, two project cars, two like parts cars. There's two Vegas, a first gen and a second gen. Uh, what else is up there? A Suzuki, I think they call it an LJ. It's the first Suzuki that was ever imported into the States. And it was, in, they were imported by, it's not these first one. It's the model of the first one. They were imported by the same person that brought in Honda. And after they imported 250 of them, Suzuki was like, uh, no, we don't want to sell these in America as our first vehicle. They're not capable of highway speeds and Americans. So we want to sell something else. So they pulled them out of the market after selling 250 of them here. Weird. One of them is up there (laughs) and I want it. I think that's called, it might as called an SJ. I don't remember what the, what they're called. Um, they're, they're hard to even find any info on. I, I think it's like a first gen Jimny in other places in the world, but I don't know what they called them here. It was a, a name for them. It was just letters like number soup, but anyway, super cool. Um, Nissan hard body, typical thing up there. Just just stuff everywhere. Motorcycles, dirt bikes, jet skis, boats. Like, you name it. It's on this property. <laughs> such cool stuff. Such a cool guy. I could see why my friend, who I've known for a few years now, is into the cars that he's into. Because he got it from his dad, obviously. Uh, what I did not realize was that he grew up in an off-grid farm that's five miles of beat-up dirt roads just to get to town to get to the bus stop. <laughs> so that's interesting. But yeah, super, super cool day. Um, it was neat just hearing his stories and learning about his, his airplanes and the whole nine. And uh, he was very excited to have somebody excited to buy the the Ram 50 off of him and instead of having to junk it. So I'll have to make sure that uh, once I get it back up and running, I get it up there so he can see it back in its full glory again. So... 
it doesn't run, obviously. Under the hood was um, what you thought was a tree. Yeah. You were like, oh, I didn't realize it had trees growing through it. And I was like, it doesn't. <laughs> it was a a pack rat, so a big rat up there. And it was filled under the hood with nothing but sticks and evergreen tree and acorns and anything else the pack rat could find to build a little home. And obviously with pack rats come urine and feces. I was also fully in effect under the hood. So of course, any vehicle from that area, you have to be careful to take, you know, proper precautions and wear proper protective gear because you don't want the hunt virus, which is an airborne virus that lives in like their feces and their just their stuff they leave behind. It was so thick under this engine bay that I don't know how familiar people are with the 26 Mitsubishi, but the distributor is off to the driver's side of the cylinder head and it sticks out probably I don't know seven or eight inches from the cylinder head and it was a solid flat mass of what looked like mud but it's probably just years of poop and pee um, built up around it and then flush with the valve cover there was another similar mass in front of where the battery goes. And there was a rat trap with a dead rat in it that was completely skeletal. It's a warning to other rats. Yeah. Well, the other interesting thing about that is the truck is missing a grill. And he was saying that the dogs, for some reason, took particular interest in the grill. I was like, huh, that's a weird thing for dogs to be interested in. And then I was looking at it, and the front edge of the hood has bite marks on it, like actual canine bite marks, and the front edge is peeled back a little bit. It's one of the main areas of body damage in the whole car. I was like, man, they were really chomping on this thing. And then when I found the dead rat right behind where the headlight housing was on that side of the truck, I was like, oh, they didn't care about the grill or the hood. They were trying to get to this struggling animal in a mousetrap. So that's probably what it was. Hmm. Um, so anyway, so it stopped the. Thankfully, it stopped him from eating more of the inside of the truck, but kept made the dogs eat the outside of the truck. So uh, I've been digging through it. I got that all cleaned up. Um, obviously, wearing plenty of PPE, gloves, mask. You know, basically a full hazmat suit in the driveway, making sure I didn't put the truck out back where the dogs are, so they don't have anything to worry about. Um, got it all disinfected the best I could. Used a lot of degreaser. Uh, actually used a ton of WD-40 at first to get like any... The reason I used WD-40 was I was trying to do the valve with the valve cover, the air cleaner off. And do you remember on the carb Mitsubishis, they have that big wing nut that holds the air cleaner cover? Yeah, as most carbed cars do with an air cleaner over the carb. Sure. But the Mitsubishi ones are slightly different because they have... It's basically a 12 millimeter nut inside of a, like captured inside of the wing nut. So it's not just like a wing oh. nut. And it was stuck on there pretty good because the mouse also had a, one of those solid masses on top of the air cleaner. And I had to like chisel through it to get to it. And then once I got to it, you can tell it was rusted probably because of urine because there's no rust anywhere else. So I'd sprayed WD 40 on it. And I noticed that WD 40 helped break up the mound. Of stuff around it's it as well. It's a surprisingly good so cleaner. I, yeah, so I used it to to kind of soften these giant mounds of grossness under the hood. Um, and then I got to that wing nut. And as I'm trying to force it, I had to like, you know, tap it with a, with a, a chisel on the side and a hammer. And it broke the wing nut free from the internal nut. So the wing nut then was just spinning around the nut and not doing anything. So then I had to peel open the wing nut and to get a 12, I still couldn't get a 12 millimeter on that internal nut because it had turned into not a 12 millimeter nut anymore. (laughs) 
So it became a whole exercise in an hour and a half of trying to open up the air cleaner, but we got there eventually. Took uh, Basically took two sides that were still 12 millimeters and opened it at a box wrench. Had to hammer it on to make it go in place like a cheap, I used a you know, cheap Harbor Freight open-ended wrench and put a screwdriver in the closed end to turn it because there was no, like, there was no other way to get force on it. I couldn't get vice grips in there because of the remaining pieces of the the wing nut. It was it was a whole disaster, but it's off now. But anyway, I noticed that it broke up those big mounds of gunk pretty well, so I sprayed everything in that WD-40. Chiseled it all away the best I could, used a power washer, then used a greaser, and then power washer, and then a different degreaser, and then power washer, and more degreaser. And it probably took a solid four or five hours of cleaning up under the hood. Um, but, I mean, you saw the pictures. It looks really good now so you would never know that it spent 20 years sitting with mice living in it so so that's good nice that's where we're at right now i haven't put a battery in it yet um i started digging through the wires because there's some wiring damage you should pull the plugs and just throw some marvel mystery oil down the cylinders yeah, I probably should do that. I was going to check and see if the motor spun at all, but that's probably Yeah, just let it do. sit for a few days. Um, yeah. But I was I was digging through it and trying to figure out, you know, what wires were chewed. It doesn't look like a lot of them were. I think a big reason for that is that he lives in the woods up there, so there was tons of you know, cuz the mice the mice don't eat the wires for sustenance. They eat them to bi- to make nests and whatnot, right? They do it to and like cuz their teeth never stop growing. So they, it's literally right, but they're always it's, chewing on it's something. Literally to wear their teeth down. Right. They're always chewing on something. And part of it though is to help build their little nests with stuff. So they're pack rats. So I think there was enough stuff in the woods there. And he brought stuff into the car every day. Like I said, there were tons of sticks. It, it literally looked like a tree growing under there. Um, I think he had plenty of other stuff to gnaw on, and he didn't really gnaw on much of the wiring. So I noticed there are off the positive and negative terminals of the coil. There are two wires that are have been gnawed, but I found the other end of those already. There's some sort of a solenoid that seems to be connected to the carburetor because it has that like sort of end of fuel end of carburetor beginning of fuel injection carburetors <laughs> that has way too many sensors and whatnot on it and the wire to the o2 sensor is cut as well so but that seems to be all i can find so far that's cut so i think as long as i make the coil wires good the car should start so we'll see but one step at a time I got to do some more digging in it, maybe after podcast. So hopefully have a pretty big update next week. And actually, you can come look at it in person. Yeah, I can. Um, Because I'll be out there. And I don't think the person we're surprising will ever listen to this podcast. So it's all right. That's okay. This podcast won't come out until Friday. And they'll know you're here by then. That's true. That's why I, I actually had that thought before I said it aloud. Um, yeah, so I also have a little project car update. I, uh, I finally moved the Volvo. Um, yeah, I I was shocked and surprised. I didn't know it was happening and I saw a picture. I was like, whoa, it's happening. Yeah. I don't know why I let it take me so long to do it. I just, I don't know. Cause you've been busy with other projects. That yeah. Are I've been related procrastinating on moving it. Cause it's like. I don't know, moving a dead car from not your yard is like kind of an annoying task to like figure out. Yep. Um, but I talked to some people here, uh, someone I used to work with. I was like, you know, that person will know at the dealership I used to work at. I was like, that person will know who I can call to tow a car. Because I just didn't want to deal with uh, calling it in as a roadside thing and then waiting like, eight hours for them to show eight up. hours. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this guy, he's, it turns out your dad knows him too. Uh, he's local out of like Peabody. Does towing. He's like, Oh yeah. He's like, I called him the week before. He's like, no, no. He's like, just call me the day you're ready. I'm like, okay. I was like, how much? He's like a hundred bucks. Okay. Nice. Literally went a mile and a half, whatever. Quick hundred bucks. Yeah, it's quick hundred it's bucks a little steep, guy. but it is what it is. Yeah. 
I mean, it was faster than what I could do it for. I would have spent yep. more money. It, it would have cost you seventy dollars just to rent a trailer, so it's yeah. well worth it for the effort. And then, try and to, honestly, I think most tow trucks are a hundred dollars just to hook up now, anyway. So, and trying to get the thing down my driveway on a trailer, and trying to get it on the trailer, like this was literally done in thirty minutes. So, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, I got to get it over there. I got it over there. At my my dad's garage. Uh, he was having some car club meeting, so that garage was occupied or was going to be occupied so i haven't put on the lift yet i'm gonna do that when i come back i'll roll it over put on the lift that's the next plan is to pull the drive shaft and transmission and then uh put the car on the ground and then pull the head and then pull the block out sure Uh, i mean that seems like probably no more than a day's work uh yeah but i'll i'll probably spread it out over a few nights of doing the transmission the diff um not the diff the axle uh not the axle drive shaft you get there eventually um yeah and then i'll probably do the head first uh so at least get the head sent out uh to a machine shop or at least look at it um diagnose what's going on yeah i mean it's gonna go it's gonna go to a machine shop no matter what so sure that's pretty much what I did to that. Um, and just in time, hey, that, that's to, a huge step, honestly, to start working on it in the winter time. But, but it's fine. Your dad's garage is heated. Yeah, I could certainly put the engine together in the winter time, and then, I mean, yep. if we got if it's the weather's decent, we can put it in. Like it's not the car is very very simple. Uh, also, I yep. you know what else I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to pull the fuel tank because uh, what was did you ever pick up your fuel tank for the Colt? I did. Yep. Okay. What did they charge you for that? So the base price was like a hundred and fifty. Okay. Um, but since mine was so bad, yeah, it cost me a lot more than that. All right. <laughs> My mine was closer to four hundred. Oof. All right. Well. Yeah. Uh, I, think it's but, still... I mean, yours shouldn't be that bad. It's the car was running recently. Yeah. My Colt has literally not run since the nineties. But I noticed, like, as he was tipping it, you know, it was nose first down the trailer. There was fluid leaking out in the front that looked like clear. But then once it was parked, all I could smell was that bad gas varnish smell. And I was like, I it think it could can't... also just be, I think that tank has a big rubber, like, piece on the front of it where the fuel goes in. Um, it could just be the rubber itself is deteriorated. Yeah, maybe, but I think it was coming out of the front of the car, out of the carb overflows, because the car was tilted down at like a steep Oh, angle. that makes sense. Yeah, because yeah. there's no, the overflows are like also going to need work because they're like dumping right onto the header. Yes. Um. So, yeah, and it just smelled horrible. So all the gas. Basically, that, that carb style is designed to overflow like to the pavement. <laughs> Yeah, it's gonna. I'm gonna have to set something up that's a lot better than that. Yeah, um, but yeah, it smelled. Terrible. Uh, that's cool that it moved. So um, that's cool that it moved. Yeah. So I, I, uh, with my with my truck project, um, I did a little bit of research and and chatting with some people that know these trucks. Um, you know, friend, very very good friend of ours and and former guest and uh, Montero specialist. Adventure Driven Design, Josh Mead. He knows these uh, Mighty Max pickups inside and out because not only is he a Montero guy, but he's also a Mighty Max pickup guy. So I was chatting with him about the plans for this truck in the future. And it's going to get a combination of a small body lift and a small suspension lift and like a 29-inch tire. Yeah, so it's gonna go from looking like you know it almost looks like a two wheel drive truck the way it sits now, but we're just gonna go with that classic '80s, slightly higher, slightly larger tire look to it. And I was looking at some things that you talk about gas tanks. I was looking up parts and stuff that are still available for it. You know, rather than sending a gas tank out, I can still buy a brand new gas tank for hundred bucks. Oh, so that's convenient. Yeah, and you can get something like a. Um you know, a BFG tire because they do make a narrower 
twenty nine, and it'll have that eighties yep. tread. Yep. Yeah, it's gonna have a very blocky looking sidewall, and then like a like a very square profile. And then uh, I need to decide what to do with the stripes on the side because it has factory stripes. So the truck is an eighty six, and at the end runs the last year of the first gen, and the end run they made a version called the Spring Special. And that's what this truck is. And the spring special got pretty much all the options and special stripes that identified it and chrome grill and bumpers or chrome grill and front bumper. So it uh, has these kind of like gradient tannish brown stripes that run down the side. Um, They look like alternating size pinstripes, but they're kind of worn. (laughs) So I'm trying to decide if I want to just take them off and do something different or run with the worn stripe look. So not sure yet. The interior is tan and it matches the stripes. So it's kind of like maybe I should just stick with that. But we'll see. But plans plans have been hatched. There's a lot of plans for this truck. And uh, Josh is nothing if not persistent with... Uh, I would just buff it and see how it looks. And maybe It's very it chalky it. right now. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping I can bring it back somehow, but the paint is like, you know, when, when non clear coated paint gets old and just kind of, you touch it and it goes in your fingertips. Yeah. It's, that's what it looks like right now. Yeah. You might just, um, use that buffer and go for it. Yeah. I'll clean it up. See what happens. One step at a time. Uh, the only, I I wasn't quite done. Sorry. The only big negatives I've come across since working on it. It's very rust free. Except on the fenders, there are these Power Ram logos that were like super loose. So I took them off because I was going to retape them. But apparently, the tape that they used at the factory retained moisture and there's a big rust hole, like one inch by one inch behind each one of them. So thankfully, it's behind the emblems. So I can clean it up and rust mort it and neutralize it and. Put the emblem back on and it'll be okay but that's the only real rust that's on the truck so overall it's good but anyway now i'm done with the truck i can move on cool yeah that's uh i, I guess that's some finally some project car updates we got something yep all it took was buying another car yeah um the the blue toyota should be gone this weekend okay. r.i.p that project all right Hey, you know, sometimes you gotta, you gotta move them along. Uh, I mean, it's going uh, to somebody else that's gonna. It's staying in. It's staying in the community of vintage Japanese car people out here. It's a friend of mine is buying it. I know it's a, um, a Toyota guy, right? Yeah, yeah. He's so got, he's got plans for it. So and the, and and you know, I was given that truck, so I was like, I can't really sell it. But then I was thinking about it. I was like, I have probably almost a grand into it. So I need to recoup some of that money. <laughs> so I'm selling it for the price of all the parts I bought for it. Well, it's, you know, the universe is is making it right. It's giving you a Mitsubishi because you're a Mitsubishi guy. And it's yeah. giving a Toyota to somebody who's a Toyota guy. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it'll be it'll be out of here hopefully, hopefully this weekend. Although this is a busy weekend, so we'll see. But it'll be out of here soon because uh, I am definitely while still in the middle of garage building project way over capacity. Yep. All right. Uh, speaking. Yeah. So let's do a little events before we get into NASCAR. Uh, this past Sunday, I went to the Linfield cars and coffee, which is fairly new. That was cool. Um, it's like your pictures were neat because it was foggy that morning. Yeah. It's like 10 minutes from my house. Uh, it was both foggy and wildfire smoke. So it was weird. It it looked the the vibe was very uh, what was that one we went to in California at, at the, like the it's coastal the observatory oh no the Griffith Park one oh yeah yeah that was up in the that was uh it's like Griffith Park cars and coffee or something yeah something like that but it was it was the same the the vibe of like the fog rolling in it reminded me similar of the early morning there yeah um so the marine layer there but yeah that was pretty cool um. There's some good stuff there. There's good some 
some good 80s stuff and 90s stuff and still uh while still having all your traditional uh muscle cars hot rods that sort of stuff so it's funny because muscle cars and hot rods are less traditional for cars and coffee cars and coffee seem to be more obscure 70s 80s stuff yeah but i don't know people are catching on they're getting up early to go um you know it's like that one of marble heads get more of a cars and coffee vibe even though it's a nighttime thing so sure um you're gonna be here for a shakedown so maybe we can figure out a way to get down here for that we'll see because yeah i know you're busy well i mean that's the thing so the next event uh that's coming up right is i'll be out there on friday it's the prescott rally yeah the day you're hearing this and there's yeah there's the park expose um which is going to be i forget where in prescott it's at a dealership i think it's a super dealership dealership? yeah that makes a super dealership in prescott it is not that one um do 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 <laughs> i got it right here yeah uh the prescott rally park expose and car show 3230 willow creek road prescott arizona at findlay subaru yep uh so we'll be there with our buddy josh and i don't know another mutual friend of yours and josh's right you the bunch of cool yes. vintage rally cars yep. and all the, the competitors cars yeah, so the, the point of the car show is the competitors' cars and other vehicles that have competed in rally other places in the world, whether homologation cars or not. Mm-hmm. So our friend is bringing up, I think, his, maybe his Alpine A310 or A110. I was told an Alpine, a Delta. A, 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 okay, so Alpine A110 is Delta Integrale Evo. Yep. And our buddy Josh is going to have VR4. Yep. I am attempting to bring the Colt up there, but I haven't driven it in months. So we'll see how that works out. If I don't have the Colt, I'll just bring the Eclipse because Eclipse is rallied too. Um, and there's some other stuff coming too that I'm unaware of. I think maybe a Padge Evo, but maybe not. Don't quote me on that one. Although by the time this goes out, it'll be Friday and nobody's going to listen to it and go anyway. So it's fine. Yeah. Uh, too late. Yeah. yeah I'm I mean, sorry. <clears throat> hey, it's cool. Things happening. Ha <laughs> ha. Sorry. Yeah, I'll be there. Yeah. Um, and then we'll start so, listening to base East Coast anyway, because I haven't lived here that long. Yeah, Sat- Saturday is the rally itself. I was gonna, I'd like to try to see some stages if I can figure that there out. Is, there are no spectator stages. Yeah. Well, I'm just telling you. I tried last year. It was very difficult. I can tell you one place to definitely go if we want to try it Saturday. All right. Um, we'll, we'll see. Maybe even Friday. Um. I can get you in probably. We'll talk about it. We're professional spectators, so. Yeah. Yeah. My hope is they don't yell at me for showing up and trying to do something after I told them I couldn't be there because I had a family event this weekend. Well, yeah, I wouldn't. That's not till six o'clock in the evening, so. For sure. But at the time, I didn't know that and I didn't want to time commit to volunteering at the rally and then have to not be there after committing to be there so i i told them that i had a family if we have to show up and volunteer for a few hours with telling them we have a heart out i would be fine doing that as well if it gets us on stage that might be a good thing because i was told do whatever you want saturday just be at the place at six which it's in the same town basically so it shouldn't be too difficult no it's like 20 minutes away um but anyway, I digress. Uh, that's what my plan is for Saturday for events. So uh, okay. it might be too tricky. Well, I'm to get saying, worst case, Phoenix. there is a shakedown that morning. And I don't know what time the rally starts on Saturday. <coughs> yeah, but I'll be up north. So we'll see. Yeah, it's only 45 minutes from here. We can figure it out. You come here, beat me here. We go to shakedown, come back here, you go back up there. We go to the rally. We'll figure it out. All right. Anyway. Uh, yeah, that's some cool stuff going on. Watkins Glen NASCAR. How cool was that race? I mean, it was great. The whole race was great. I know. It's funny. 
when you see people that bellyache about NASCAR and road courses. I don't understand it. Um, Nothing maybe to complain about. It's amazing to watch. Maybe because mid pack they are reckon, but they'll wreck mid pack on an oval. So I don't know what to tell you. Yep. It's it's yep, the same. It's literally the same people wrecking on an oval. They'll also wreck on a road course. So yeah, the difference is who they take out with them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and boy, howdy, did uh, <laughs> did a lot of uh, every uh, playoff, playoff driver. Part, yeah, got wrecked <laughs> or damaged, yeah. like. Um, cause I, uh, uh, my boy Ross Chastain got the pole. He did. With, yep. Yeah. He, uh, he's been working with, uh, SVG who they're technically not teammates this year, but they will be teammates next year. But sure. it's like, you know, they're talking about on the broadcast, like, yeah, they're not teammates, but they are teammates. Like they're clearly they clearly did some feedback for each other because. Oh, absolutely. Cause they had the same results. They led a lot of that race. Yep. And then that was, the, then it was a weird spin uncharacter and characteristic spin from Suarez on a road course that brought out a weird caution. Um, and they ended up staying out longer. So that was the other thing. There was supposed to be a tire the tire was supposed to wear out. It apparently did not. I don't know what it did not wear out. No, I don't know what Goodyear makes these tires out of. But I mean, if you're if you're trying to sell people on tires that don't wear out, you're you're working. It's working, Goodyear. Well, they were saying that what I heard was that during practice, the tires lasted between twenty and twenty five laps. Yeah, which is not a pit window. No. So they thought that they were going to fall off and there's going to be huge competition created because of this between pit stops and strategy and the whole nine. They were cars out there running nearly the same lap times after 40 laps in the same tires. So that didn't come to fruition. Towards the, towards the middle of like stage two, when SVG and Chastain had old tires, they were out smoking everybody in the front one and two. They were running like 100%. Like they were like locked in. Like I was 100%. joking in the Discord chat, they're like shake and bake. Like, yep, they were going for so it. So, what one of the stories I heard was that practice and race day are very different because on practice you're just running a couple of cars, and the track eats tires up. When you're running a full pack of cars, you're putting rubber down on all of those same areas, lap after lap after lap, and it's effectively smoothing the racetrack kind of like when you use a piece of sandpaper dry and you sand it a lot and eventually it stops sanding anymore because it's full of the product that you're sanding. Yeah. That's part of the problem that's happening with the track. The difference between, yeah. The track loads up with rubber and it becomes basically smooth sandpaper. Yeah. And they had run the entire Xfinity race the day before. Yeah. And there's no rain. And then there's no rain and they ran the entire NASCAR cup series race the next day. So there's hundreds of laps times, you know, 75 cars or more. And it just winds up building up the track with rubber. And, you know, you're on a road course, every car is running essentially the same line. So that line is just building up with rubber and it's just, you know, smoothing the track out and being that loaded up sandpaper. So you're not losing as much of the tire as you would be in like a couple car practice. So they also added more rumble strips and that did not matter at all <laughs> didn't matter at all they were still cutting right over them <laughs> <laughs> like they put basically what's on the edge of the highway to wake you up or warn you that you're at the edge of the highway out on the outside of like turn one and they were just yep. still as deep outside <laughs> in turn one. Oh yeah yeah they were miles outside in turn one they did not care um, and then even through like the bus stop they're just like ditch hooking the inside edge of the turn to go around. Yeah. So full on, full on Fujiwara tofu delivery through. The and again, stop. the NBC broadcast, so much better than the Fox broadcast. Right? So good. It's so uh, good. They're Lee running, he brings so much to the, yeah. to the table. They're running a throw. So through the bus stop, the camera angle, amazing. It was like a high speed yep. cable cam. Um, yeah, it was like the one they used to use to follow the ball in the NFL when they get kickoff. Yeah. So just like 
super high speed panning, like like side running alongside the cars as they're going through the bus stop. It was awesome. Yep. Yeah, and they had to count on that the whole time because their stationary can got taken out in the first stage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the first lap, huge wreck. But uh, yeah, there was a several crazy wrecks. Uh, Byron got on top of Kislowski somehow. I was essence. really, really hoping they had an in-car view from Kislowski's car to see how far into the car that tire went. Yeah. They never had it, though. But, um, you know, the and then, so anyway, we talked about that weird uh, caution and, you know, SVG and Chastain had to run long. Eventually they came into pit and they went to the back and they put on fresh tires and whatever they had, the two of them had for setup again, they were locked in. They, you watch them, they climbed right back up to the front Yep. and, and knife their way right up there. And, you know, I think, you know, Chastain ended up plateauing around like fifth, but SVG went right to the front. And I think he ended up, at some point, Chris Busher ended up at the front. Um, and you could like watching SVG run him down was like wild. Right. Absolutely. And then uh, I, who brought out the last caution that I don't um, remember. Wasn't it the one with the, the big one with talk about the Keselowski car? Oh, I guess it was. Wasn't that the last caution? Yeah. Yeah, or or was that one of the multiple cautions that brought over time? I don't know. Ca- cautions it, it, breed cautions. It, it so. got a little ridiculous at the end, and I guess that's what that's probably what frustrates people. But you know, it ended up there was like three or four restarts, uh, so it kind of gave you know, there's definitely like a learning curve, and when you have multiple chances there, you know, SVG finally figured out he kind of pushed Chris Brisher at the. On the last restart, kind of pushed him in the right rear, going into turn one, got him a little loose. It wasn't like a dirty push. It was like just like I'm gonna no, move you out of the me. way. Yeah, it was totally legit. And he he got by him coming out of the, out of the turn one and up into the S's. And you're like, damn, he's got it. And he led for a whole lap. There was two laps to go because when you're in overtime, it's like two laps. Uh, yep. yeah, and green white checker, green white checker, and they get around and uh, Busher was still like moving along. He was locked in on him on the SVG. Busher reeled him in yeah. the S's on the last lap. Yep. And he then came to within like a tenth of a second behind him or less. Yeah, he was wheeling. In the S's. Yeah. Uh, and then it it forced it it got under SVG and he made a little mistake through the bus stop yep. and exiting the bus stop. Busher paid him back with a little push, like wasn't dirty though, like just nudged by him, forced himself by because he slow uh, SVG slowed up and he took it Race and he over. won. And it was like, well, I really wanted SVG to win, but that was legit, man. That was a yeah. that was legit race, and like that is yeah, not was great. That yeah. was not dirty. That was like the way you should race. Like if you, yep. you, that's that is the way NASCAR racing is expected to be physical. Where it's not, and even at the end, SVG's interview and Bush's interview, they're both just respectful of each other and happy that had how much fun they had. And you know, SVG was like, "Yeah, I'm disappointed, but man, that was fun." <laughs> yeah, and he he went up to them afterwards. There was a, a on uh, Instagram of him going up in the winter circle, and they're shaking hands and stuff. And it's like that's that's the way it should be. Yeah, and that's where you right? where you look at like Austin Dillon's hit. <laughs> A few races ago, it pissed off everybody. So that was dirty. like ridiculous. Yeah, but you know, a little bit of elbows up in NASCAR is the way it, it traditionally is done. Yep. Yeah, moving moving somebody out the way is not the end of the world, as long as yeah. it's done in a way that doesn't put them in the wall. If yeah, or if SVG had just spun them in the first corner, everyone like, what the hell, man? Yep. Uh. And then no, sometimes it, you got to move them to get by them. Yeah. But if, and then if, if Busher, like if he was already loose and Busher came up and just threw him in the wall, then yeah, people would have been like, man, that's like, what the heck? <laughs> so, and then, uh, 
I mean, SVG pushed real hard. He got into that turn seven and was like trying to catch him and then just got loose. And you could just see he just, yeah, just like just right. washed out. And yeah. he was like, all right, I'm done. And just yeah. was like, well, it was it was either overdrive the car and make it work or overdrive the car and go wide and maybe hit the wall. But and not get second. Second so, anyway. Yeah. yeah. So he, just, he, he had nothing to lose at that point. So he pushed as hard as he could. And, <laughs> and I think I was like, uh, no. Yeah, he had old tire. I think the the highest placed playoff car was like Chase Briscoe, <laughs> like right. fifth or something. Yeah, no, it was wow. a, it was a big mix up as far as playoff points go. So, and Bristol's gonna be nuts too. So, it's I I dig I dig the schedule that NASCAR put together for the playoffs. It's uh, it's highly entertaining for sure. There's no, there's no bad tracks in the playoffs. No, Except I'm questionably Phoenix. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm excited for um, next year though because I've got, I've already got tickets to NHMS and that's a playoff race. So, yep, that's cool. Yeah, um, but anyway, yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a podcast. That was a good race. Oh, go back and watch the uh, Xfinity race highlights. That was also really good. Yeah, I heard that. I have not watched it yet though. Yeah, I forget. Uh, Connor Zilch, I think, the rookie. Guy yeah, just the... just got in the sport, basically, or in the, that level of the sport. Yeah, but he's got like an IMSA driver. Um, 18 years old, uh, won five of seven ARCA starts, won the pole in the truck debut at Coda. IMSA class wins in 24 hours of Daytona and 12 hours of Sebring, 2024. Wild. And he's going to drive for Junior Motorsports next year. Sweet, but he, Junior's uh, actually driving a comp, a um, a Xfinity car next week at Bristol, I think. Nice. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, you can follow us Auto Off Topic podcast on Facebook, Auto Off Topic on Instagram, Auto Off Topic on Threads. Uh, I've got some more grid life photos to share. I shared some other stuff. Uh, we've shared some scale autocast stuff. Uh, working on some RC cars, and. Uh, I'm on I'm a race and anger on Instagram and threads and send us messages to get in the discord. We'll send you an invite. Uh, you know, we've got some people that can, if you want to do EAWRC on our team, we can probably find a space for you because some people take time off. So let us know in the discord and Brad, where can they find you? Uh, they can find me all those places and also at TSI SS three five zero. I have not, I'm on, it's at Instagram and on threads. Yeah. I did put a little teaser of the truck on threads, but I haven't posted it on Instagram on the podcast page yet. So that will be coming now. This episode is going out. Um, I'll have some before and afters of the engine bay. So come check those out. Um, and uh, yeah, that's where you can find me. All right, cool. Keep girls analog. The name of the roses. <laughs> <laughs>